If you have been keeping an eye on award-winning websites lately, you have probably noticed that gradients never really go out of style. They have been used in all sorts of creative ways over the years, but recently, I have seen a few sites take it even further by making the gradients interactive, and the result looks incredibly cool. I realized we haven't explored anything like that on the channel yet, so I thought it was the perfect time to dive in and build one from scratch. While browsing around, I came across this really smooth, abstract gradient shader on shader toy, so I took that core idea and turned it into something more interesting for the web, a fully interactive, flute style gradient background. To show it in action, I placed it behind a clean landing page with a logo and some placeholder content. When you move your cursor around, the gradient responds in real time, creating a smooth fluid distortion effect. More importantly, I made it highly customizable. I have added a bunch of config options so you can tweak everything, colors, brush size, distortion strength, trail length, intensity, even the softness of the blend, all from a simple object. Personally, I've always found it tough to come across a gradient element like this that you can just drop into a site and fully customize, so I built one that's easy to customize and also looks cool. If you find my work helpful, I would really appreciate it if you drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you'd like to access the source code for this project along with hundreds of other similar micro projects and a complete new website template every month, you can check out the pro membership via the link in the description. Alright, let's get into it. I've kept the HTML very minimal, just enough to support the interactive gradient without adding any unnecessary clutter. At the top, we have got a simple nav element just to make sure the page doesn't feel empty. It includes a logo on the left and a few placeholder links on the right. Right now, I'm just using basic paragraph tags for these since navigation isn't the focus of the video, but you can easily replace them with actual anchor tags or components later. Next is the main section marked with a class of hero. This is where the actual animation happens. Inside that, the first element is a div called gradient canvas. It's just a simple empty container for now, but this is where we'll inject our webshell canvas using 3.js. It will cover the entire viewport and sit behind all the content. Then we have got the hero logo element. It simply holds a centered image placed right in the middle of the screen sitting above the gradient. Totally optional, but it helps balance out the layout visually. And finally, there is a hero footer at the bottom of the section. This also includes some placeholder text for now, just to give it that nice footer touch. That's it for the HTML. Next, we'll move on to the CSS. You can see I've already imported the host grotesque font from Google Fonts. It's a clean modern typeface that fits well with the overall aesthetic we are going for. Next, I've done a quick reset, removing default margins and paddings and setting the box sizing to border box. This just makes the layout calculations more consistent across the board. For the body, I've applied the new font we just imported. The images are set to stretch and fill their containers nicely without getting distorted. And for all the paragraph tags, I am keeping the text white, slightly smaller than normal, with a clean medium weight. Now let's style the navigation and footer. Both the navbar and the footer are absolutely positioned, stretched across the full width and given some generous padding. I have used flex layout to space everything out evenly so the logo sits on one side and the nav links or footer content align on the other. The nav links have a nice bit of spacing between them to keep things from feeling cramped. I'll make the logo text slightly bolder just so it stands out a little more. The footer is anchored to the bottom of the screen and mirrors the same layout style as the nav. Next is the main hero section, the area where our gradient animation will live. It takes up the full width and height of the screen and hides anything that might overflow. This gives us a clean canvas to work with. Then there is the logo in the center of the screen. I positioned it right in the middle and scaled it down to a reasonable size so it doesn't overpower the layout. And finally, we have the gradient canvas. This is the empty container where the WebGL canvas will be rendered. It's stretched across the full screen and will eventually sit behind everything else. I've also added a quick media query for smaller screens. If the window width goes below 1000 pixels, the nav layout shifts into a vertical column with extra spacing just to keep everything readable and nicely spaced on mobile. Now, if you're looking at the page at this moment, it will look blank. That's because the background is still white, the text is white, and the logo is also white. So nothing's really visible yet. But don't worry, it will all come together once we bring in the gradient animation. That's it for the CSS. The structure is now in place, and we are ready to move on to the JavaScript to start building out the gradient effect. Before we get into script, 
Let me show you this file I've got called shaders.js. This is where we'll keep all the GLSL code that WebGL will use to generate our interactive gradient effect. If you've never worked with shaders before, they are basically small programs that run directly on the GPU and they are essential when we are doing low level rendering like this. In our case, we are using a pair of shaders, one vertex shader and two fragment shaders. The vertex shader handles basic screen positioning. It tells the GPU where each point should appear. And then we have got two different fragment shaders. The first one is what I'm calling fluid shader. This one is responsible for simulating motion and interaction. It tracks how the mouse moves across the screen and creates a flowing, almost liquid-like velocity field behind it. We store that simulation frame by frame, which is how the trails effect are able to persist over time. The second one is the display shader. This one takes the output of the fluid simulation and turns it into the actual gradient visuals you see on the screen. It uses a mix of color blending, distortion, and some matte driven variations to generate those rich, organic shifts in color and shape as you move your mouse. I'll be honest, I don't have any experience in writing shaders myself, so for that, I got little help from Claude to write both shaders in a clean and modular way. Alright, that's the shader setup. Next, we'll bring everything together inside our main JavaScript file and start building the logic that powers the gradient. First, I'm importing 3.js. That's the code library that lets us talk to WebGL without drowning in boilerplate. Right after that, I am pulling in three shaders we saw earlier, the vertex shader, the fluid simulation shader, and the display shader. We'll fit those straight into 3.js in just a moment. Next, I am declaring a config object. Think of this as our master control panel. It holds every trickable setting in one place, brush size, brush strength, how much the gradient distorts, how quickly the fluid decays, even the trail length. I am also parking 4 hex color values in here, plus a couple of global knobs for overall intensity and softness. Later, we'll be able to swap any of these numbers and instantly get a brand new vibe without touching the shader code. Finally, I've added a tiny helper called X2RGB. The shaders expect colors as normalized red, green and blue values, numbers between 0 and 1, so this function converts a standard hex color into that format. We'll use it when we pass our palette into the display shader. That's the setup. Next. We'll create the camera, the renderer, and the render targets that let us ping pong frames and keep the fluid motion alive. First, I'm creating the camera. We are using an orthographic camera, not a perspective one. That means there is no vanishing point or depth. Everything gets drawn flat on the screen, kind of like a 2D canvas. Next, I'll initialize the WebGL renderer. This is what takes all our shader code and draws it onto the screen using the GPU. I've enabled anti-aliasing here just to help smooth out the visuals and reduce jacked edges. After that, I'm selecting the gradient canvas element from the HTML. If you remember, this was just an empty div inside our hero section. Now, I'll tell the renderer to match the size of the browser window and then inject the WebGL canvas directly into that element. So at this point, we have got the basic canvas and rendering setup ready. Now comes the important part, setting up our simulation memory. In order to simulate something like fluid motion, we need to store each frame of data so that the next frame knows where everything was before. To do that, we use something called render targets, also known as frame buffers. Here I'm creating two of them, fluid target 1 and fluid target 2. These are basically off-screen textures where we can render our simulation. Instead of drawing directly to the screen, we draw to one of these and then use the result as input for the next frame. This gives us that continuous frame by frame memory that fluid effects need to look smooth. Both targets are set up to match the full window width and height. I have enabled floating point precision here using float type because we need to store high precision data like motion vectors. We are also using linear filtering to keep things smooth when we sample from the texture and we are using the standard RGBA format to store 4 channels red, green, blue and alpha. After that, I am setting up two variables. Current fluid target will be the one we write into on this frame and previous fluid target will be the one we read from. We'll swap these two back and forth on every frame, so each frame builds on the one before it. This process is called ping pong rendering and it's a super common trick when working with simulations like this. And finally, I've added a frame count variable and set it to zero. We'll increment this as the animation runs and it will help us track how long the scene has been active so we can pass that into the shaders as needed. Next, we define the actual shader materials that make all this come to life. We'll start with the fluid material which handles the background simulation. 
This material doesn't draw anything directly to the screen. Instead, it gets rendered to one of our off-screen frame buffers and it's used to simulate motion over time based on user input. We are passing in a bunch of uniforms to control how it behaves. First, there is time input which will store the current timestamp in seconds. Then we have got resolution input which holds the canvas width and height. This helps the shader scale correctly across the screen sizes. The mouse uniform holds four values, the current X and Y mouse position and the previous X and Y. This lets the shader figure out the direction and velocity of the movement, which is how we get that fluid effect. We also pass in frame input, which is just the current frame count. We'll increment this one on every render. Then there is previous frame. This stores the last frame of fluid data from the render target, so we can blend the whole frame into the new one. This is what makes the fluid motion feel continuous. After that, we have the 5 additional uniforms that control the look and feel of the motion, brush size and strength determine how wide and strong the cursor input feels, fluid decay and trail length control how quickly the motion fades and stop decay slows things down when the mouse stops moving. We'll feed all of those values in from the config object we created earlier. Then we attach the vertex and fragment shaders for this material, the same one we had in the shaders file. Right below that, I am creating the display material. This is the one that actually gets rendered on the screen. It uses the fluid simulation as input and applies that as distortion to a colorful gradient. We are passing in the same time and resolution uniforms here and also sending in the texture that came out of the fluid simulation. Then we define four color values. These come from our config and get converted to RGB using the text to RGB helper function we set up earlier. We also pass in a few other visual settings like the distortion amount, color, intensity, blending softness. These help us control how smooth or dramatic the animation feels. Now that both materials are ready, I'll create a simple full screen plane geometry. It's just a 2x2 two two rectangle that covers the whole screen. Then I'll create two meshes, one with the fluid material and one with the display material. We'll use this to render both passes separately, one into the simulation buffer and one onto the actual screen. Lastly, I'll set up mouse tracking. I'm creating a few variables to store the current and previous mouse positions. Then, inside a mouse move event listener, I calculate the position of the mouse relative to the canvas using get pounding client tracked function. Since WebGL uses a bottom left origin, I also flip the Y value to match that. Every time the mouse moves, we store both the current and previous positions and update the mouse input uniform in the fluid shader. This way, the shader can react to the movement in real time. I am also storing the time of the last movement. We'll use this later to know when to stop the input and let the fluid decay naturally. And if the user moves their mouse out of the window, we reset the uniform to zero so the simulation doesn't get stuck or glitch out. So at this point, we have got two active shader materials, a full screen plane to render them on, and a working mouse input system that powers the fluid simulation. Next, we'll set up the animation loop to update everything frame by frame. I am defining a function called animate and I am calling request animation frame at the start of it. This is the standard way to build smooth GPU accelerated animations in the browser. It tells the browser to call this function on the next available frame. Inside the loop, I start by calculating the time. I am using performance now method and dividing by a thousand to get the number of the seconds since the page loaded. Then I update the input time uniform in both the fluid and display materials so our shaders stay in sync with real time. I also pass in the current frame count to the fluid material, we'll increment that at the end of the loop. Now here is a small detail that makes the motion feel more natural. If the mouse hasn't moved in over 100 milliseconds, I reset the mouse uniform back to zero. This helps the fluid settle gently when the user stops interacting. Next, I update all the uniforms that come from our config object like brush size, brush strength, decay values and so on. This way, every time you change the config, it takes effect immediately in the simulation. So for the display shader, I am updating the distortion amount, intensity, softness and all four gradient colors. These get passed as uniforms and they drive from the final look of the gradient on screen. After that, I handle the actual rendering in two steps. First, I assign the previous frame texture to the fluid material's previous frame uniform. Then I render the fluid mesh into our current render target. This step updates the simulation and stores the result in a texture without displaying it on screen yet. Next, I pass that texture into the display shader as fluid input. Then I render the display mesh to the screen using set render target null, which means render to the visible canvas. At the end of the loop, I swap the render targets. This is how we achieve that ping pong rendering effect where the output of one frame becomes the input for the next.
I store one in a temporary variable, then flip them around. And finally, I increment the frame count so the loop stays in sync with our simulation. After that, I've added a simple resize event listener. Whenever the window resizes, I update the render size, the resolution uniforms, and the sizes of both render targets. This makes sure the animation always fills the screen and looks sharp, even if the user resizes the browser. At the very end, I call animate function to kick off the loop. That's it, our simulation is now running in real time, fully interactive and completely resolution aware. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.